My name is Jeffrey Kahn, and you're listening to a podcast from digitaloilandgas.com. This podcast is entitled Building and Testing Your Digital Innovation. Many of the digital innovations I've reviewed struggle to get to a customer trial. So why is that, and what can be done about it? Over the past two years, I've had occasion to be exposed to a number of great business-to-business digital innovations that I think offer stupendous uh, customer advantage. They're creative, edgy, and advanced. They incorporate some of the latest gadgetry, like cloud computing, augmented reality headsets, smartphone apps, blockchain, analytics, and the Internet of Things. They're dead easy to learn to use. You see them in action, and you think it's a no-brainer for a customer to move to purchase. Many, however, struggle to get to market and seem stuck in first gear. Part of the problem may be an inability on the part of the founders to articulate the value that the solution offers. It may be that the novelty of the solution creates too much risk for the potential customer to accept. And it may be that the customer can't see how the solution would work in their context. Oftentimes, customers tell me that these innovations look more like solutions looking for problems to solve and not the other way around. Recently, I spent a couple of hours engaging with an entrepreneur with the solution he was trying to advance. After some explanation, I was able to grasp the business problem that he was trying to solve, but for the life of me, I couldn't grasp his solution. There were simply too many unanswerable questions, or questions that I thought created a risk that I couldn't quite see beyond. Now, I may be more overly risk-averse, but if I can't get it, then I'm pretty sure a real customer, that is, an oil and gas outfit, is going to struggle to make the business case. They hate being first with anything. Innovation has to be as fully de-risked as possible. And whatever the proposition, it needs to be shown to work in their context to get any consideration. They need to see how it will be implemented, not just what it does. So how do you deal with this? Well, once upon a time, I was working with a downstream oil company that was, by their own admission, well behind the times. The cash registers at their retail stations were so obsolete that they resorted to scavenging parts from underused ones. Credit card authorization took a full 30 seconds because the equipment was so old. Debit cards could not be implemented because the software at the register lacked the ability to recognize that kind of card. The competitors had long since introduced a crazy new innovation called pay at the pumps, something we all now take for granted, unless, of course, if you live in parts of Oregon or New Jersey. But for our clients, with their obsolete systems, pay at the pumps was simply not feasible. So the company decided to embark on a sweeping project to overhaul their fuel stations. The scope was audacious at the time. All new signage, colors and branding, new cabinetry and cash registers with scanning capability, and new in-store software. Our scope was to sort out pay at the pump technology and make it work. We would have to face all sorts of challenges. The pumps were too expensive to replace. They were mounted on concrete in the forecourt. So we would need to work within that constraint. Some sites didn't have good network coverage, so we would have to trial a satellite connection. The number of credit and debit cards to process numbered in the hundreds. And for the first time, the fuel pumps with their new pin pads would need to connect to the cash register system inside. You think of all the players involved to make this system work. The inside store supervisor and the counter service staff, the motoring public, the accounting team, the bank technology teams, the telecom services, both satellite and terrestrial. And then there's the hardware. Fuel pumps from Jill Barco, the CRIND technology, pump controllers, the new cash registers, modems, and scanners. To deliver pay at the pump for the customer, not once, but at 750 stations, at eight pumps per station, and in two countries, we needed to make dead sure it would absolutely work in all weather conditions, in multiple languages, and in multiple currencies. It needed to be easily installed. Customers needed to be able to use it without training. And it needed to hit a sub-second response time. No one was going to wait outside 30 seconds for a credit card authorization. So our solution was to commandeer a conference room at the client site, within which we recreated the entire pay-at-the-pump experience. We installed a working fuel pump and tricked it to dispense imaginary fuel when we squeezed the nozzle. We brought in cash registers, scanners, modems, satellite connections, and test debit and credit cards. We had workstations that represented the customer, the cashier, the shift supervisor, the back office, the bank, corporate IT, help desk, and other key roles. And on the walls, we mapped out all of the various processes that would happen. Everything from a working purchase, a stolen card, over-the-limit cards, drive-offs, which is a kind of theft, cold weather, high-volume activity, the network being down, interrupted transactions, and mixed inside-outside sales. 
We had flowcharts, checklists, problems to fix, project plans, documentation, performance targets and measures, and other project data. We built the integrations we needed into the existing systems, including finance, human resources, and store inventory. And as we worked the solution, we posted updates to the walls. In time, we perfected the solution and we were able to implement it successfully across the fleet of fuel stations. The challenge I see with digital innovators and entrepreneurs today in the business-to-business -business area is that they tend to take too narrow a view of what their solution is going to deliver. This is perhaps admirable in maintaining focus, but I fear that it does not result in a minimum viable product that an oil and gas business can embrace. In my pay at the pump example, the minimum viable product had to incorporate a pretty complete range of features to be minimally viable. If today's digital innovators are going to succeed in selling their solutions to a demanding industrial audience, they're going to have to take a page from yesterday's digital playbook and bring more complete solutions to the table. A digital solution that only reflects one user experience is simply too narrow. Think about all the possible roles and services inside a corporation that could be impacted by your solution, and at a minimum, you'll encounter financial controllers, accountants, and engineering services who will have needs or will be impacted. And then there's what's the process that you're trying to address. Your digital solution must fit in within some business context. Try to draw out the process so that you can at least show the inputs and outputs and where you anticipate integration, maybe to some existing company system. More persona will show up here. Think about the use cases and the scenarios, particularly the most extreme ones. And of course, what is the hardware? Unless your solution is a pure cloud thing, it probably has some hardware component. If that's true, you need to show how you can integrate with at least some of the hardware category leaders and have an answer to how the solution is extendable to other pro providers. It goes without saying that you need to fit in with all the requisite user hardware like tablets, smartphones, and browsers. And what about data? It's a good bet that your digital solution takes a fresh look at data, either creating new data, such as GPS location information, visual data, distributed ledger data, or tokens, or aggregating data in the cloud or via analytics. Who uses this data? Which, by the way, creates another user. If your solution needs data that might exist already, well, where does it come from? More people are involved. It's a pretty good bet you'll need to integrate with ERP systems like SAP and Oracle. So who do you fear? The oil and gas industry is very safety environmentally conscious. You need to be able to answer and show how your solution does no harm to people, the environment, and equipment, and ideally improve safety conditions under use. How do you respond to questions about cybersecurity, hackers, and other digital vulnerabilities? And then you need to consider some key variables. Business will want to understand how your solution will behave under varying conditions. This is particularly true for blockchain solutions that incorporate some kind of token with some kind of valuation. You need to be able to show on a model how the tokens are created, transferred, sold, traded, swapped for cash, valued, and destroyed. How does your solution behave at different commodity prices, currency values, and interest rates? And finally, how do you make money? My pay at the pump solution made money by raising traffic volumes and increasing throughput. All those 30 seconds add up. But how do you make money with your solution, both for you and for your customer? And this again is particularly true for blockchain solutions that create value via tokens. So in conclusion, digital innovators should use techniques like what I've just described, the conference room pilot, to show how their solution fits into a business context. You have been listening to a podcast from digitaloilgas.com. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe to future installments and visit us at digitaloilgas.com.